Welcome to Center of Weirdness, the very weird podcast about very weird stuff, but mostly it's just about very weird TV show episodes that we enjoy. And this is a very special episode uh, this month, um, this week, this time that you are listening to it, because if you're listening to it on the day that it drops, it is Friday the 13th, uh, September 13th, uh, 2024, to be precise. And um, for this very special occasion, we are finally getting around to covering Friday the 13th, the series. I'm Josh, and with me for this very special episode in person is Skinner. Hi, Skinner. Hey, Josh. Hey, everybody. Hey, my cats that are walking in and out of the room because Josh has some very curious what he's doing in here. That's right. Uh, We are recording in the same room. This very rarely happens. I think this has happened maybe three times. Three or four times. Three or four times in the, what, seven years that we've been podcasting together? I think we've attempted at least five. Yes, we've attempted it. We uh, started podcasting together in early 2017 um or late 2016 i think we started the show and then uh it came out in early 2017 with with our predicto cast show which you can hear in this feed if you scroll back far enough good episodes in there um and yeah so we we've tried to record many times together and it in person the the few times that we have actually been in person and had time to record and we've always had technical difficulties so who knows if this episode will actually get recorded properly or if you'll hear a garbled horrible mess that I'll have to clean up in some way and it'll sound terrible but we're we're fingers crossed that this is the this is this breaks the the spell of bad luck that we've had. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that your little recording device here, much as I do love it and all its buttons, might be a cursed item. That may be. It might be a cursed item that would have been in. What was the name of the store? Vivaldi store? Verandi store? Vendredi store. You Vendredi. Got, which is French for Friday. Oh, that's what it is. So, yeah, we are we're recording this on Labor Day weekend of 2024. This is actually the. Not only um, it is an, a special anniversary for the f- Friday episode that we're covering, but it's also our seven year anniversary of the first time that we met um, in person. So we recorded a podcast together for about nine months before we actually met in person. Um, so if you go back to those first like nine months or so of Predicto cast from like early 2017, there's some good episodes in there and we had never seen each other in person when recording them. Um, but yeah, we're talking about Friday the 13th, the series that's been on our list for a long time. We, um, love uh, anthology horror shows. Um, in fact, um, that's kind of a spoiler for what's coming in the month of October for all of our, our Halloween episodes. Um, we're going to be looking at anthology horror and, uh, Friday the 13th is kind of an anthology horror, sort of. There's a tie in overarching character uh progression with people who are at the antiquities store the cursed item store but otherwise they don't really have a lot episode to episode there are 72 episodes i believe there are some that are multiple parts or yeah. have callbacks but in general it's your monster of the week type anthology yeah so there's obviously a lot of stories we could have chosen from um we did make use of this this website called um episode.ninja i think or episodes.ninja so if you never looked at that you should but what they do is they they take all the various shows and i guess they use probably like imdb ratings or whatever to make them to like find the the best ones and the worst ones and we thought about doing one of the worst ones but it was about a guy who like hates his wife so much that he uses some magic item to turn her into his dog who he loves a lot and that seemed like maybe some dicey territory. There's like 17 different ways that can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it could have gone very, very poorly. But what we settled on instead was I don't even think on that list. I think uh, the reason that we we touched on the episode that we're going to talk about today, uh, Night Prey from um, November 13th, 1989. That was part of the reason we picked it because it came out on a 13. What that happened to be a Monday, not a Friday. The scariest day of the week, <laughs> according to Garfield. That's right. And it is actually the scariest day of the week. Um, and so we decided to cover that one 
uh, because the reason we covered that one is because of the uh, the Wikipedia description, which I had to um, I laughed at a lot. So I I was like, well, we have to do it because specifically because of the Wikipedia synopsis. A vampire hunter steals a golden cross that kills vampires in order to get revenge on the vampire that turns his wife into a vampire. <laughs> and I just love the fact that a single sentence has vampire in it four times. And I was like, well, that's the one we're covering. And um, that description is pretty much the episode. <laughs> that it's- is. I mean, it promises a lot of vampires. We do yes. get a lot of vampires. We A few vampires. Not a ton, but They're a few. Like, the ones outside the window floating. That's true. There are there are a few. You're right. There's a decent number of vampires in this vampire a, show about vampires. Not a decent amount of action or interesting things happening. <laughs> no. So we, we are... We start with, I guess, wh- what is the... I guess we should talk about what uh, the series is about because it has nothing to do with the show, like with the with the series of movies. Rather. No, this, Sorry. Is, this, this is nothing like Fr- Freddy's Nightmares. Yes. Has at least Freddy doing the interstitials and has a few episodes that involve Freddy. Yes. This has nothing to do with <laughs> yes. Friday the 13th other than the store is called Vendredi's Antiquities and Vendredi is French. For Friday. Friday. And this is a very Canadian show. So it's it's because the people who owned the rights to Friday the thirteenth, like they they wanted to include the like they, they wanted to just basically cash in on the series, even though it has nothing to do with the with the actual movie plot at all. According to IMDB, the Series is not linked to the movie series at all, obviously. They are searching for magically cursed objects that were sold through their uncle's store. These are the two younger characters. Cousins. Cousins. Um, Reportedly, the last item that was supposed to be retrieved in the series finale was to be Jason's hockey mask. Um, And they played with the idea of having a hockey mask in one of the episodes as an in-joke. There never was any serious intention to try to tie the series uh, together. So it's it's incredible to me that you would do that. You would maybe plan it. You would have 72 episodes and you still wouldn't get to it. (laughs) Well, originally they were going to have five seasons um, and the series finale would have had them discovering a spell that would reverse the curse on the objects collected throughout the show. So I I want to I watch this as a a young man in Canada because this was on a Canada Canadian made production. So I saw you had not saw it before. Yes. Here was my impressions as a kid. A, very poorly lit. (laughs) Yes. Two, two, very boring and slowly paced. Uh And three, confusing because the episodes were confusing and you kept waiting for it to have some connection to Friday the 13th. Yes. So at least you knew in advance the third part. Would you agree with the first two parts? Uh, yeah, yeah. I it, it was it was a. I remember seeing ads for it. Like I never I never saw the like an episode of the show, but I do remember seeing like an ad every now and then. I think it might have aired because it was it was Canadian, obviously, and I think it was in syndication. And I think they might have shown it on like the Sci Fi Channel. That sounds at, right. At least in America for me, I, I think I could be wrong, but I think that it was sci fi channel, but I never watched it because it didn't because at the time that I saw the show was also around the time that I was getting into her a little bit. And whenever like USA would have their Friday the 13th, like weekend marathons, whenever a Friday the 13th happened to fall, like in the summer or something, mm-hmm. I would watch those. And then the series was be would be on, but it didn't look like it had anything to do with the show. And I just never got around to watching an episode. Yeah, I assume that's what most people's reaction was. <laughs> it, it, like, it, what, I know we say this a lot about a lot of shows we cover, but this has, for once again, having a very, you know, strong IP name that's lasted for yeah. ever. Uh, it has so little cultural imprint <laughs> like it it's free on youtube because no one really wants it yeah. and like no one uh, you don't see people talking about oh yeah i remember this one episode of friday the 13th series like it just didn't i think everyone would like maybe dip their toe in and like oh 
what is this? Like, and that's uh, your reaction to it. Like really quickly is, huh? What is this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not campy. No, it's not, it's not campy enough. This one, this one was very like, um, very melodramatic, uh, uh, very, very much so, especially with our, with our lead guy, Kurt Bachman and his, uh, his wife, M- Michelle, um, like, and I didn't, I knew that I kind of knew the basic premise of like the two cousins whose uncle like ran the shop, but then the uncle, I think he dies or something. Right? Uncle and, like, dies in the first episode and then goes was, to hell and comes back as a ghost a couple times. I, I think, I think so. Cause he had, he sold his soul to the devil yeah. to let him have a cursed artifact store, <laughs> which I guess is part of the, you know, the chamber of commerce's uh, deal. This is yeah. what Neil Breen had to uh, uncover <laughs> in faithful findings. Well, Robert, Robert Johnson went to the, uh, went to the crossroads and asked for an antique store. <laughs> it's what an odd concept. And then to bring in a, a character to replace that character, I assume it's a pilot episode thing. Yeah. Who is just basically an uncle character too. Yeah. I wasn't really sure what his deal was. Jack Marshak. I, I believe he's a friend of oh, okay. the original Vondrady and he does, has exactly the same, uh interests and uh background except for he's he didn't make a deal with the devil yeah and he is dressed like a a, a renaissance fair blacksmith half he, the episode he is and he has a fantastic voice yes he does he's got like a good he's got a good voiceover artist voice uh chris wiggins who plays jack marshak but he is we open the episode with him um sitting on a park bench it looks like he's like half drunk and he's kind of reminiscing over like um, how bad things have been. Like it's weird that the the younger people are supposed to be the main characters, and this guy is like kind of a secondary character. Yet he really seems like the main character of the show. I wonder if this episode, because he was supposed to have the connection to the priest, who also we do not know, <laughs> but like in canon, he's the one who has a connection with it. So this episode runs through him. Yeah, but they don't re- like. This is an episode. This is a show where they have two characters, younger characters, one with ginormous hair. Oh yeah, Roby. Her Rob- hair it seems to get bigger in every scene. Every scene, and she plays Mickey Foster uh, from Foster's Imaginary <laughs> <laughs> House of <laughs> Imaginary <laughs> Characters. <laughs> yeah, ifs. Um, but like, they do a lot of like. He tells them, "Will you go and investigate this?" And next time they're back at their very regular looking house attached to the. I don't really, we don't see the uh, antique shop nearly enough. No. They come back to their very normal looking kitchen and they're like, yeah, we did it. Yeah. They, (laughs) they go to the funeral of, of father McKinnon and they go and do all this other stuff and you don't see any of it happen. It's just happening off screen. screen. It's like this entire, like there's an entire episode of them that we don't see. Yeah. they're, They're having their own adventures, but he is doing this like weird reminiscence of like, just like the death of the things that they're trying to do and like the artifacts that there are the, these things that they're trying to recover and get back. And I, I don't know what the, the impetus is that these things have just been sold randomly through the store, through like it's years of operation. And now they realize they're all cursed and are trying to retrieve them or I think, but also in this case, it's an ancient, like, cross that's been in the church forever so they have well that was a that whole conceit was like very much a thing that that happened in shows in this kind of time period like there was that um what was that there was like a western show like something of the, oh, the deeds uh, of black jack McGraw I was gonna or say something. lonesome dove <laughs> well there was some sort of like black black jack mcquade or whatever like something you, like that, that sounds so made up I'm going to find this, this show, full, um, me- uh, full metal alchemist. Do you think? No, it was like, it was like, um, Oh gosh. What? Like the adventures of black Jack, something or other. And, and he had to like solve some mysteries or something like that before he could like go to heaven or whatever. I can't remember what it was. Um, and then there was also from my, uh, Oh, the 100 Lives of Black Jack Savage. That's what I'm thinking of. So That's a really great name. I mean, this, this might be a show that we have to cover, too. It's a series. Notoriously greedy and corrupt, blonde Wall Street businessman hiding from the FBI in a Caribbean island run by a gaudy dictator teams up with a legendary ghost pirate Black Jack Savage to save 100 lives and avoid going to hell. Well, we're definitely covering that show at some point, but... 
my love of 13 <laughs> ghosts of scooby-doo right there is but it. the funny thing is that like i'm assuming they built that in to be a hundred uh episodes it ran for seven so they didn't actually get there and there was also and that was also 91 uh so pretty close to when this show was on the air and then there was um a hundred i think a hundred good deeds of eddie mcdowd which was a nickelodeon show where um the the titular guy was like a bully and he um, gets turned into a dog. 100 Deeds for Eddie McDowd. It was from 99. Also might be a show worth covering. Um, and he gets transformed into a dog that must perform 100 good deeds to help a shy classmate. Uh, or with the help of a shy classmate. And that only ran for 41 episodes. So they didn't even get to the 100 Deeds thing. And I think there was like Martin um, or Richard. Richard Mall was a. Uh, was like a drifter who put a spell on him, who turned him into the dog and he would show up from time to time. And I don't think that they, I think the show got canceled before they finished. Um, and so they never got to actually like get his full, uh, his full deeds done. But this was like a thing that, that was like a kind of a plot line for shows at this point in time. Cause obviously, uh, as we said with the Friday, the 13th show, they like, had like a certain idea in mind of, Oh, we're going to do five seasons. We're going to cover all these artifacts. And then the last one is going to re repair all the, the damage done throughout the run of the show, but they didn't get there. What's funny is that the Blackbeard show is the second role ever of Roma Downey, uh -huh. a friend of ours on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we've ever covered anything about her, but we always are on the edge. No, of we covered that. Uh, we covered that Christmas movie that she Christmas was movie, in. That's right. But we're yeah. always on the edge of almost doing more. Touched by an angel, for yeah, sure. For sure. But uh, this one is, uh, this episode is the kind of a very early role for Jill Hennessy. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But who, who is in four different episodes of this show. But of the Blackjack show? No. Oh, of, of Friday the 13th. 14th. Um, but never the same character because <laughs> she's a she's a the vampire. She's a vampire in, in this one, right? Yeah. And she gets killed very quickly. Yes. She's making out with the other main lady vampire and she gets uh, she gets uh, killed by the uh, by the magic cross. So anyway, let's let's continue on with this stupid show. Um, but but Marshak is sitting on the, the bench. This is the uh, after everything that has happened in the episode that we're about to see. He's lamenting all this death and whatnot that's happened whenever um, they're trying to recover all of these these artifacts. And we flash back to August 1969, Summer of Love. And uh, oh, look at that. We're in we're in an anniversary of of when this episode uh, occurred or we were just uh, when we watched it. We were in the anniversary um, of of uh, August of 1969, the 55th anniversary of when this awful event occurred. Um, but Kurt Bachman, he's having a uh, dinner with his wife, Michelle. They're having a pleasant evening. Um, he is supposed to be, I think like 24 or, or 22. I, I mean, his hair's more feathered at the start, but he looks, he looks like what, like the, he looks like the, um, uh, the, the Gibb brother from the Bee Gees that they don't talk about that they like the property brothers have that weird third brother. This is like the weird fourth or fifth Gibb brother that they keep in a closet. He's just, I mean, he doesn't look as bad as he looks later when he looks miserable, but no. like, they're really shooting him from a distance. It just, there's no way, like I know the road owns you so much more in the eighties. We've talked about this <laughs> at nods in the show where like everyone in an eighties TV show could be anywhere from 23 to 65 yeah they're just an adult and he is <laughs> very much an adult that's yes. all he kind of looks like very much an adult um but yeah he he looks he looks a bit like this is a weird deep pull but he looks a bit like um peter sarsgaard in the green lantern movie <laughs> where he's got like this big five head and and uh, feathery hair uh and a mustache and um but they're they're having dinner lovely evening and they're out for a walk in, as you mentioned, the deepest black uh, forest you've ever seen, where it's barely visible. Um, and they get attacked by a vampire uh, swooping down on on top of them. Knocks uh, our buddy, Kurt Bachman, 
totally overdrived. Yes. He's knocked. Like he's not. He's like Krillin from Dragon Ball Z. He gets knocked down immediately. Yeah. And simply cannot get back up. No, he he's like a. He is like a turtle on his back. He cannot be flipped over and he watches helplessly as he's cucked. Uh, <laughs> yes. As his, as his uh, beautiful wife is bitten um, by this vampire and they fly off into the night. And he assumes she is dead. Yes. She, because he, he's an idiot. Yes. He assumes that he's never seen a TV show before. So he doesn't realize the fact that he saw her get bit means that she's a vampire. Um, and then so we, it is a twist later that she is. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're supposed to be surprised when we, we find out later that she's still alive in some fashion, but he um, we get the opening credits here, which is a, a fun little shot of, of moving through the the store, seeing all the different artifacts, seeing all the the different items throughout uh, getting our, our credits list, which we were taken aback by when we saw that the first name was just Roby. Um, yeah, <laughs> which, it, it, it's really weird for the first person to be monosyllabic name. <laughs> yes. Um, it's just Roby. It's this is Louise Roby, obviously, as, as Mickey, which we already mentioned, but who is much more interesting than anything in this show. Yes, she's definitely way more interesting. We'll we'll talk about her in a little bit, but like um but she I guess she had a band or something, so she just decided to go by her last name uh because that was more, you know, more interesting. It, it made her a huge star. Yeah, it, it, it did. Wor- it don't did, worry about it. It did make her a huge star. Um but uh but yeah, so we we see through the little shop, which is fun. It's it's kind of reminiscent of what they did for the um uh for like the Are You Afraid of the Dark credits, uh, where you kind of are going through the attic and you're seeing all the weird uh things that are inside. Things that make you think, I'd like to see the episode about that. <laughs> yes, exactly. The things that look really interesting in the uh in the credits that you and never is, actually see in the show. And this is where, you know, uh, Marshall got his idea in, for the evidence uh, <laughs> attic in yes, uh, Erie, Indiana. Right. Yeah. So um, we we cut to modern day, 20 years later. Modern 1989. Yes. Um, and we see a woman coming out of a club. Uh, I think the woman here is actually Jill Hennessy, right? Yes, that's, yes, this that's, is that's Jill who Hennessy. it is. Yeah. Um, so she comes out of this club with a man. And they're they're going to go home together and they um, they cut through an alleyway and the guy keeps trying to say, like, hey, let's just go to my apartment. And she's like, no, I want to do it here in this dirty alley. Um, and there is a man following them um, and we, we see them make out for a bit and she bites his lip and licks the blood and turns out oh, she's a vampire and uh, she proceeds to kill the guy uh, that she's making out with. Uh, the man that's following them, uh, who we soon realize is our good buddy, Kurt Bachman from the opening. Um, he holds up a wooden cross and doesn't really do much to her. She just kind of knocks him out and throws him into some boxes and goes to uh, jump on him to kill him. But as she does, he um, holds up a stake, which she proceeds to fall on and <laughs> dies. Um, so, you know, this is a vampire who is too stupid to live. <laughs> All she had to do is not do this. Like all he all he did was plank. Yes, <laughs> he he just basically got lucky. He essentially, ba- he's basic. She he basically turned her into Homer's foot stepping on the nail. <laughs> oh, fiddle dee dee! <laughs> this will require dying. <laughs> Kurt Bachman, the world's luckiest vampire hunter. Um, I mean, his, his he basically lucks into. Everything. Everything. Yes, it's not even like he's like actively seeking things. He just he lucks into finding the, this the cross, cross that that pres- that starts the whole he run even, of the story. He doesn't even know what it does when it happens, and he doesn't seem to always. He's not good at making it do. What- <laughs> yes, it just kind of does what it wants randomly, and he goes along with it. So he he um he kills her, but then he runs off like he's afraid. And I think maybe that's there's other vampires chasing him. So but there's the sound of. Yes, we have to mention that a lot of the soundtrack of this episode is pan flutes in the background. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, there's a lot of men hissing at each other, like single shots of men hissing, which they seems like they included maybe more than they needed to to get the runtime to the 42 minute mark, especially near the end of the episode where there's a big hiss fight. (laughs) Yes. So he runs into this church. He's being chased by these vampires and he finds a cross that's inside this uh, glass case in the middle of the church. And he 
uh, smashes open the glass and grabs the cross out. And a priest um, comes out uh, and hear, hears what he's doing and comes out into the church and is like, hey, what are you doing? Stop that. And he, again, like the vampire, falls onto this guy who is killed because there is like a blade hidden in the cross. This is one of those crosses that you'd buy out of the back of like the uh, like Black Belt magazine or some sort of like you'd buy Ninja Stars and you'd buy a cross with a knife hidden in it. It's so Castlevania, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You would expect he's also um, oh, we didn't mention the part where he breaks open the wall of the church and finds a chicken inside. <laughs> the whole church part seems so. Bizarre, because like it. It, it, it tells you of a connected story that you don't know. Yeah, because the story is not it, it's interesting because it's not about like him actively seeking the cross to kill these vampires that killed his wife. Like he's been on this crusade for 30 or 20 years to try to get revenge on the guy that murdered his wife. Again, he does not know she's a vampire somehow. And like, what's he been doing for, for 20 years? Because it doesn't seem like when we find out who the vampire is, he's very public. He's Eric Van Hellier is the vampire. He owns a nightclub. He doesn't seem to be like in hiding. He's a very rich, wealthy, well-known guy. I mean, at one point, Kurt just goes up to his club and goes, can I come in? And you're like, <laughs> you cannot. And he's like, God damn it. <laughs> and then like, <laughs> it's like 20 years of preparation to be like, Oh, huh. <laughs> like and, and like not know what to get get his ass kicked the first time he's see, he's seen by a minor vampire. Yeah, he he doesn't he doesn't know. And then he like, crosses Jordan. <laughs> well, he doesn't know the dress code for the club. He's gets he spent twenty years prepping for this and then uh, gets kicked out because he's not wearing the right jacket. Yeah, he, he gets there and is like, uh, "Vampires wear uh, beige dusters, right?" And they're like, "No, <laughs> tight fitting black." And he's like, "God, oh, Jesus Christ!" And they're like, "Stop saying that." <laughs> but yeah, he goes into the he goes into the church to hide yes he goes in the church to hide finds the cross kills the priest and then the cross starts to glow and i was like oh because it, it drank the blood of a human well yeah because i was thinking that there was going to be something of like oh the cross requires blood to like be powered to kill vampires and that's something when they do they look in the book about it later there is something to oh that. there is okay I, I think i missed that part but it, that makes sense though because a lot of the artifacts in the show we requires, were looking at like episode description it requires you to kill someone else in order for them to do something and for if you're you. sitting here like going hey guys there's an episode of this series directed by david cronenberg why didn't you do that episode <laughs> that's josh's call because it didn't have the word <laughs> vampire in all four hey, times if david cronenberg had put four vampires <laughs> in a single sentence i would have been there also you had already seen that one that was the one that you would watched as a kid right it was really spooky but uh, it, in we, my should, head. we probably should have watched that one in hindsight because this episode kind of sucked there's a good chance that episode also sucked <laughs> that's very true yeah we, we i mean we were you know we what, just, what, is, what does the episode Ninja say about that episode? <laughs> oh, the, the vampire one or the hand one? The hand one. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. I'll have to I'll look it up. Uh, I don't even know which one that one was. Well, um, it's probably whatever one's near the top or has like the glove in the name. Yeah, that is. Let's see here. Faith Healer um, from 88. An unscrupulous faith healer uh, discovers a powerful glove that turns him into a killer. Let's see. Uh, where that one ranks on the episode.ninja website. So it, it looks like the the first, um, the top rated episode is episode 15 from season one, Vanity's Mirror. Um, but let's see if we can find where Faith Healer is, if it if it shows up in the top, uh, the top 10. Um, uh, so far, it's... Uh, I'm not seeing it. It's going to it's going to be right. Wouldn't it be great if they were right next to each other? Oh, like we were both we would both be wrong. Yeah, no, it's it's actually number 17 on this list. What so is what is our six one? point six point eight three uh, rating? Let's find. Let me find the uh, it's, it's probably going to be like near the near the fucking bottom. I'm sure because that, that'll be my. Oh, OK. Well, it doesn't even show up on the best of list, which is it only goes to twenty five. So it's not even on the it's not even on the top rated. Let's see if we can find it under the worst the worst rated list. Um, worst rated is Year of the Monkey, and then the one where the guy turns his wife into a, a dog is number two on that worst rated list. So at least we didn't we didn't pick that badly. The Vanity's um, Mirror one is about an unattractive girl who uses a magic mirror to corrupt to make corrupted 
magic compact to make boys who insult her fall in love with her. And then oh. she kills them. Oh, that sounds good. Um, let's see. So far, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing ours on there either. So it's like ours is like right in the middle. It's, mid. it's not the best, but it's also not the worst, mid, which is mid, 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 which mid, is a good. Mid. Yeah, it does not. It does not show up on either list. So that's actually a positive. We picked one right in the middle. We picked, uh, we, uh, we, 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 ro- we rolled a strike. Uh, although, yes, that's right. Although. I did um, in looking at this. I did see one that we probably should have picked um, because it sounded it sounded pretty great. It's um, called Night Bitch. <laughs> that is a movie that's coming out. Um, the one that we should have picked probably is Root of All Evil, which came out a, a few weeks before the Faith Healer. Yes, uh, Ryan and Mickey search for a cursed mulcher, which is the murder weapon of choice for a gardener's assistant. Um, but so we, you know, we went right down the middle. We, we, uh, you know, not too high, not too low, which is what this show is all about. We, we we stay center pretty, of mid, we stay pretty, yes, yeah, it's center, it's, it's, center it's, of midness. That's so, what we are. That's why we were the center part means something to us. <laughs> that's right. We like to go right down the middle. Not too good. Not too bad. Not too great. Not um, too bad. So, um, they, uh, this, this priest dies. He, um, he, um, uh, our, our friend Kurt runs out and runs off with the, with the cross. Um, Marshak and Mickey, uh, are at the church talking to another priest because Marshak knew the priest who died. Um, they and, probably had great adventures with each other. Somewhere yes. Else adventures that we didn't see. Um, but they, they were friends. And so this, this is kind of upset Marshak cause he's, he's very sad about, Hey, we're trying to do good work by getting all these curses back, but also it's killing people um along the way which is which is unfortunate so um, uh the kids don't think so uh roby is like yeah it's worth it <laughs> oh that's right later on he has this like crisis of conscience and like well should we be doing this or is it worth it or should we be trying to do, get all these things back and she's like yeah probably um and this is around the time that kurt does try to go to the vampire club but they won't let him in because it's members only and he's not wearing the right jacket um, and they take him into an alleyway to beat him up, but he ends up setting a guy on fire with the, with the magic cross. We do get a pretty good charred corpse. Here. Yeah. We get a couple of good charred corpses in this, some flame, a good flame effect, some guys on fire, which is pretty good. Um, and, and people getting, uh, turned into crispy skeletons, which is not bad. Um, and at the same time, um, they, they find out a bit about, the the guy going to the club so they're like who owns the club van hellier evan van hellier um it's pretty close to vampire <laughs> um and so they go to talk to him uh marshak goes to his house but he's not in because it's daytime and he's a vampire um and the assistant who is a human uh talks to him and he says hey i was looking for this guy who tried to get in the club and he might've had a cross with him. And, you know, we're trying to find this guy and the assistant realizes that it's the cross of fire as he calls it. Um, and Marshak kind of starts to realize like, Oh, maybe Van Hellier is a vampire. Um, and like Bachman ends up at Van Hellier's house, uh, at night. Um, he starts to attack him and Van Hellier realizes who this guy is. And uh, instead of them fighting, Van Hellier just jumps out the window and flies away when he sees the cross. Um, yeah, there's, this is this is the first of our many. <laughs> um, and Bachman, he goes upstairs and he finds these two uh, lady vampires making out. Which I guess is that progressive for Canadian television in 1989? No, that's, that's basic rules. <laughs> okay, like American television, no sir, we couldn't have that. We had War of the World, we had The Hitchhiker, we had Red Shoe Diaries. Don't worry about us. <laughs> yeah, Canada way more progressive than America. Um, we loved our anthology shows, and we loved our progressive shows that nobody watched. <laughs> so he goes upstairs, he finds these two lady vampires making out. Uh, he kills one of them again with the cross, setting her on fire. Um, and then he finds out that the other woman is actually his wife. Dun, dun, dun. We're supposed to be surprised by that, but we obviously saw it coming. Um, 
And he proceeds to kidnap her and lock her up in his basement of this warehouse that he lives in. Um, and he decides, I'm going to kill Van Hellier and that will free you of your vampirism curse. Now, this is not established vampire lore in the episode. At least they don't talk about it. They just it, sort of say it matter of factly. And yet it does not happen. And, and yet it doesn't matter. <laughs> like it clearly is not a thing that occurs. The guy's just probably out of his mind. But again, he's had 20 years to do research and like kill other vampires. And like, what's he been doing? <laughs> he's, you know, he's been mastering the blade. <laughs> yeah, that's right. While you were studying vampires, I was mastering the blade. But he and he, lucking into killing them, lucky into killing them. Like he has really no plan. He does feed her a uh, a sex worker. Yes, he picks up a lady from the street with no no words, just just looks, just simmering just vibes, like, <laughs> just vibes. Just puts his there's a, there's, a, there's it's so great because he go he goes up and does the arm next to her head thing against the wall, <laughs> and they show like each other's eyes smoldering to each other. Yes, and then they zoom out and he's a schlubby guy. And yeah, a, he looks like he looks like um uh like he looks like a, a human version of Sam from Sam and Max. That and like Gr- uh, Grizzly Adams. Oh God, what was what was that guy's name? Uh, Grizzly Adams. <laughs> Grizzly Adams. The the actor who played in Grizzly Adams. Um, uh, I'm sure you Googled it last night. Dan- too. I did. I did Google it because he's in that. He's in that horror movie Elves. Uh, like Dan Dan Haggerty, I think is his name. I'm, oh, pretty, uh, I'm pretty sure he was in Gl- Grizzly all our, Adams. All our Elves fans will know. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was a different guy. Maybe he was not Grizzly Adams, but I thought he was. Um he he's in Grizzly Mountain, so maybe that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> is um, he in Lonely Mountain? Uh, n- uh, no, he's in. Oh, man, I need to I need to dig into Dan Haggerty's filmography. He's got some great sounding movies. One called Repo Jake, and one called Deadly Diamonds, Danger USA, also called Mind Trap. Um, I wish they were all Jake, like Deadly ter- Jake, <laughs> Terror Night, Abducted. Terror Jake. <laughs> Uh, he, he was he was Grizzly Adams uh, in a couple of TV movies, Legend of the Wild, the capture of Grizzly Adams. Could you bring back Grizzly Adams now? Um, if you did it in the Yellowstone universe. Oh, maybe the life and times of Grizzly Adams. Once upon a starry night as Grizzly Adams. Fletch lives in Grizzly Adams. <laughs> we might have to um, we might have to cover some some Grizzly Adams TV movies because <laughs> um, they're so I'll- popular. Also in a movie called Desperate Women. <laughs> Desperate Jakes. Um, wow, we really need to dig into Dan Haggerty's uh, filmography here. It's that's some, there's some good stuff. Um, some some really ice pawn. Um, <laughs> the Love and Dynamite. Uh, abducted to the reunion. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> abducted to non abducted. The Little Patriot. <laughs> Father Frost. The Little Patriot um, has to be animated, right? Um, yes. Uh, Escape to Grizzly Mountain, where he doesn't play Grizzly Adams. He plays Jeremiah. Um, uh, oh, maybe Jeremiah was Grizzly Adams' real name. Let's let's see. Uh, no, it's James. So he's playing a completely <laughs> different character. But anyway, that's what that's what uh, modern day 1989 era Bachman looks like. But um, they. Uh, so so Van Hellier knows uh, that Bachman was the one who kidnapped Michelle um, and he tries to break in uh, and to rescue her. But um, Bachman has like drawn um, like crosses all over the place in the room, which which does impact uh, Van Hellier. And he's very weak and he tries to give blood to um to michelle but uh she can't he can't get to her and so he he runs off bachman tries to kill the assistant they fight a little bit but everybody escapes um and this is this is when he goes and gets the the sex worker and brings her back um and and has her feed uh van hellier goes to the antique store at this point and tries to like lay the groundwork that, oh, this guy, Kurt Bachman, was the one who has your cross and you should go get it back. And he's a bad guy. Um, but Marshak notices 
that in the reflection there I- there isn't one for Van Hellier, so he realizes, oh, he is probably a vampire. That's the only like real vampire-y thing. Yeah, besides the sharp teeth and it, the holy water. There's no garlic in this episode. No. They, they, did he have to wait for them to leave the restaurant because they were eating at an Italian restaurant? <laughs> that's probably what. Yeah, that's what it, that is what it is. They were having a nice outdoor al fresco meal, and um, and he was like, I can't get too close. I got to wait till they're away from here because this garlic is gonna. Is gonna uh, screw me up, but he does. He does put a glamour on Mickey. He does try to like. He kind of flirts with her a little bit, and she's very interested in him. Her giant hair and giant eyes. He heard yes, her giant hair. He does say like, uh, she's like, oh, would you like something to drink? And he's like, not at the moment, but maybe later. <laughs> like he's he's putting his moves on her. Um, and you were on, you were you were very big on the idea that a lot of these actors weren't saying their their lines phonetically. Well. It seems like Michelle, his uh, his wife, definitely is was like seemed like she learned her language, her learned her lines phonetically, like the way she delivers them. It's pretty strained. Um, and I think you said she was a Quebecois, maybe. Yeah. But, was- but still, that doesn't explain her delivery unless she's just a bad actor. Um, and so the team uh, of the from the antique store, we haven't even really talked about was it James is the other guy? He doesn't he, really do anything. He comes in and says, Hey, that, is that a fresh cup of coffee? And at the end he's like, <laughs> he goes, no, we should go back, which was a bad idea. They didn't need to go back. No, they didn't. So uh, they end up at the, uh, they end up at the warehouse and they're able to get in and steal the cross. Um, and they escape. And once the cross is gone, Van Hellier, who's waiting outside with his assistant, decides now's the time to get in there and like kill um kill Kurt and and uh, you know help Michelle escape. So they um they go in and Mickey I think is is the one I think Mickey and James both are like we should probably go back and help them because if Van Hellier is a vampire, he's going to go and he's going to kill Kurt. It's going to be a whole thing. And they're kind of like, I don't really want to. Like, Marshak's like, I don't really want to go back. He's, yeah, like, he, he's like, this isn't our problem. We were asked to bring the cross. We have the cross. This is literally vampire business. Like, yeah, why are we? Why would we die over? I think Marshak, too, is like, that guy probably killed my friend. I'm I'm fine with him getting what, he's, what he deserves. Yeah, and like, <laughs> what do they accomplish from going in besides killing the second guy? Uh, nothing. Like... Bachman decides that he wants to be with Michelle forever. So he, he asks her to turn him and she does. She, she turns him into a vampire. So we get some vampire fighting. We get, um, we get <laughs> Bachman and Van Hellier fighting. We, the assistant is killed immediately by, by Bachman. Once he's turned into a vampire, I think he just like breaks his neck and throws him to the side yeah. and immediately he's dead. And they, they fight, they have a, nice long um hiss fight they they jump around through the air on like wires and stuff for a little bit and at one point um van hellier is about to uh take an axe to bachman and kill him but michelle like stops him and says you know please don't and van hellier i love it he takes the he takes the axe and just like smashes it into a wall and breaks it into pieces which of course leads to a shard of it falling next to bachman's hand which he grabs this broken axe handle and shoves it right through Van Hellier's uh, chest and kills him um, very quickly, which he then like he like shrivels up into like this gross, like raisiny corpse that's like shattering and breaking into pieces. And the head skull breaks open. There's worms in his brain. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a really good effect. And then um, and then Bachman, who tries to like and he tries to leave with Michelle but then Marshak shows up and just throws holy water in his face well he comes up he comes up the stairs and like he sees them and he goes <laughs> yeah like he's he's still like hyper in his like a cat and is having his zoomies yes and so he's like well fuck off and he throws <laughs> Yeah, uh, like a, a, a sprinkle of, of uh, holy water. So I thought, we thought at first like, oh, man, he's going to have facial scars. Yes, he'll like burn up and he'll be like he'll be disfigured or something. But no, he just burns up immediately, shrivels up into a corpse. He's dead. Marshak is about to kill Michelle 
but he decides against it for whatever reason. There's been enough killing of the people who are already undead. <laughs> That's right, yes. She does um, not turn back into a human because the person who changed her to die. Yes, no, it, that doesn't count. It doesn't matter in this universe. So yeah, he doesn't kill her. We all know that Marge is actually the head vampire. <laughs> That's right. Um, and she then like runs off. And this is, we kind of like flash uh, to the next morning. And Marshak is kind of just hanging out around the store waiting for her to show up and kill him. <laughs> like he's fully expecting her to get there and like murder him, but it doesn't happen. So then, then we get what we got at the beginning, which is him like sitting on the, the park bench next to the water kind of lamenting the fact that all this death and, and destruction has happened in the, in the quest to recover all of these like artifacts and, he, and he looks like a haunted sep- objects, a seventies sad rock song. Yeah. Come to life. He's got a little, he's got a little Donald Pleasance about him a little bit. Yeah. He's got, like I said, like everyone in the show is playing it. 100 percent sincere yeah no and great his, and his voice brings all the gravitas yes he's got a great voice he looks he looks cool they all look they all look cool um but they're the soundtrack is good when it's there <laughs> but there's a yeah. lot of scenes when they're just talking in the house where it, it, it sounds like a soap opera or it sounds like a british uh sitcom, british tv show where there's yeah. just you hear the footsteps, you hear them walk across the floor, you hear <laughs> yeah. them sit down, you hear every enunciation they do. And it's just, kind yeah, of like, you hear every silence between them. Yeah. And this is where I think as a kid, I watch them like, I'm not fucking watching somebody talk and then silence and then talk and then silence. So, and so that's basically the episode there. There's not, there's nothing else to it. Um, other than that, um, we, we should talk a little bit about, Louise Roby, I think the the lead actor in this episode who doesn't really do much in this episode because it really her hair does a lot. Her her hair does a lot, but it really does seem to be, you know, Marshak's episode um, for for this particular story. But she was I think she was in it pretty much the entire run. Right. She was she's always been in the show. Yeah, She's all 72 episodes. Um, And she. um. Uh, you know, obviously first build in the cast. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really get a whole lot to do in this particular story, but we were looking her up because we were curious. So like right after we watched the episode, there is a playlist with every episode, I think, except maybe one on uh, YouTube. So you can definitely find that and watch these if you want. I think maybe worth revisiting, finding another episode and and checking out again. Cause they're all uh, anthology shows have the even though this one has kind of an ongoing story, everything is different. They have different directors, different writers. So you could get a good one somewhere in there. Um, but afterwards, there was a, a short like five minute video of a clip of her on a forgotten talk show. It was a late show, the late show, but not the late show you're thinking of. And it was basically uh Joan Rivers show, but not when she was hosting. It's like, <laughs> like she was, she was no longer the host and there was going to be another host. I think it's, I've heard the name. They were also more famous. Yeah. And this is the guy in between for like two seasons. <laughs> and he's just, he looks like a caricature of a host. Like I looked at him like he's reminding me of 19 different people. Yeah. Several of which are Howie Mandel. Yes. He looked a little bit like a kind of a, a alternate reality. Joe Piscopo. A little yeah, bit. A little bit. <laughs> He, um, and he's just, you know, he, he's there to it. The way he t- did it was very of the time where like attractive lady comes out and he's just trying to make get, get her to tell stories about who she fucked. <laughs> yes. So she comes out and she talks a little bit about like her name. Like this, this is clear that he did no research whatsoever. Like his, his staff did no work to actually explain <laughs> what what this was because like she uh she went by roby which was her last name her name is louise roby um and he does no work to figure out why she goes by roby he's like oh you're like roby kind of like you know madonna or share or or um why is it like that is it short for something is it short for roberta or whatever and she's like no no i just wanted to go by a cool single name and then she's like oh it was my last name like finally she after like a minute of kind of uh, stringing him along a little bit she finally just reveals that's my last name um but anyway he talks 
to her for a while about her band and all of this other stuff. And so we were kind of like, oh, what's her band? Let's go look it up and like see what, you know, what she what she did. I think she had a couple of um, she had a couple of like albums. I think she put out like one album in 85, did a cover of One Night in Bangkok, the song from Chess that like charted in in like the seventies, but it was like a dance hit for a little while, had a couple of other little like songs here and there. Nothing, nothing super, um, nothing super crazy. She had a song on the money pit soundtrack, you know, real, real basic stuff, nothing amazing. But then we started looking into her personal life. And in 93, she started dating Charles Beauclerk, the Earl of Burford, and this guy is the direct descendant of King Charles II and his mistress, Nell Gwynn. So, uh, Roby um, got pregnant um, and with, their, with their child. And her son, James Malcolm Aubrey de Vere Beauclerc, Lord Vere, Baron of Hanworth, um, is the future Duke of St. Albans. So the lead actor from the Friday, the 13th TV show is the mother of a Duke. She's a former lady Buford Burford (laughs) Burford. Um, So yeah, she was a, uh, um, she was a fashion model, I think for a while, but yeah, this, this lady who was on a forgotten TV show uh, that that's only real claim to fame is its name. Uh, is the is the mother of a of a future duke, which is just so bizarre. Like you never know where your life is going to go yeah. when, when you uh, when you uh, start out. It's funny because in the in the interview, not the show, she kind of talked with a y'all accent, a little bit, yeah. But she's from she's born in Quebec in Montreal, which <laughs> yeah. is maybe or may not have French, but Roby's a French name. And she was educated in Scotland <laughs> and she traveled all the world and speaks four languages. Why would that be her default? <laughs> like she did. Was it trying to play airhead or, or what it was? I don't it? know. I, I heard something and I could be totally wrong on this, but I heard something once that like, uh, like Scottish accents were as close to Southern accents as you could get or something like that. There was like some European accent that was actually remarkably similar to like a Southern accent and maybe her education there. She picked up some things and her like weird mix of, of regions and all of this stuff together, like created this very unique, weird accent that only she has. Um, But what I was, what I was going to wonder about is like, we already talked about kind of how this had nothing to do with the, with the actual film series. um, And that you know they had the idea of maybe bringing it in at the end and and trying to tie it together but like if if for some reason this was in the the mold of like a Fre- of a Freddy's nightmares or like a tales from the crypt but it was still connected to the Friday the 13th film series how would that play out would they have Jason who is not actually a very talkative character would he just like come out and like murder someone like my idea would throw, be throw a knife into something. Yes. Or my idea would be that it's the story is the framing device is people around a campfire telling a story very much like you get in some of the Friday the 13th uh, movies. And then at the end of the episode, like Jason has been listening to the story that they've been telling and having nightmares. And then he, well, then he comes out and like attacks them, you know, at the end or, or something like the story ends and every episode ends the same way with the kids like running away as Jason comes out and tries to kill one of them or grabs one of them and pulls them into the, uh, I would, I would have it where like every now and then they pass a newspaper and it says three more dead at crystal. Lake. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, it is an obvious thing to have one of the Chris relics be his, his mask. Yeah, for sure. But also he has multiple masks. So it's not like there's a mask. Yeah. I think I think that would be a fun that would be a fun way to do or that. Or mom's though. head. Yes, that would be a fun way to do that though. If you just have people telling stories, you just want it to be goosebumps. I do. I want it to be. Are you afraid of the dark? That's that's oh, yeah. kind of what that's what I want it to be. Is are you afraid of the dark? But with but with Jason, like, um, and every episode ends like that episode of uh of the Simpsons with Ernest Borgnine when he's like telling the story in the woods and then the creature comes out at the end and kills him. I know that like 
They did. They did. Did they reboot? Are you afraid of the dark? They have rebooted it a couple times. So like it, it is surprising to me that since there's a group your age who are so fond of it. Yeah. That they've never done the like, here's the gritty reboot where like they did kind of where murders uh, actually. Happen. Yes, they actually did in uh, I think like in the mid 2000s or late 2000s. They um, it might have even been earlier than that, but they did do an episode where the the kids who were telling the stories in the show, they had like an actual real like ghost mystery thing happened to them. And it was like a it was like an hour and a half TV movie where they had to solve some some like mystery and like free a ghost or something like that to survive the spider's curse. <laughs> yes. Simply recite a Bible verse. <laughs> but yeah, they did do that. And I actually watched I remember watching it and I thought it was like so so. Um, but yeah, they they had I think they might have even done a couple of those like they might have had um i just because I, I was thinking like they always keep edging towards the adult grown-up power rangers yeah like they that i mean that would be that would be kind of cool why do they've never why have they never done a horror power rangers you could do any. like they all get the powers of uh they all have to fight like pumpkins pu- well public domain like uh monsters it seems very obvious to do that, but yeah. also maybe even public domain is too much money for, <laughs> for, for Saban. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think we're, we're probably uh, have talked as much as we can about Friday the 13th, the series, um, a little disappointing, not, not quite what I wanted. I think it's because I picked the wrong episode. I wanted vampires. I got them. So. It's so hard compared to the, the interstitials with Freddy for yes. Freddy's nightmares are so delightfully stupid yes and it, and it's like even when he's not in the show which those are always better when he's more integrated into the series or into the episode but like even when he's not when he just shows up and floats around or tears through a brick wall it's still fun because we get to do the freddy voice and go you, listen to this look at these messages from our sponsors bitch yeah and like it's you know, more fun for that alpha bitch cereal <laughs> <laughs> i wish that it had been like the uh when you when like an actual show, um, have you ever have you ever been to a, like an actual show taping? I, I have for some game shows when I was a kid. Yeah. So when I was a kid, I was on a show. We had a local show uh, like a, a public access. It wasn't I, it wasn't public access because it was on one of our major networks, but it was like on the affiliate of an NBC affiliate or whatever. And it was a, a retired um, a retired county sheriff who drew funny pictures. Kids would be in the audience and he would get ideas for them. And then he would draw weird animals with like tiger bodies and elephant heads and bat wings. And he would that draw sounds delightful. It was weird. His name was uncle Bucky or cool. Bunky uncle Bunky. That's what it was. And he, um, he was a big guy and they, uh, a, f- a kid that I knew in one of my classes, I think he was either related to him or something, but he had his birth- nephew. <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Um, but he had his birthday party at the studio. And then we got to go watch a show taping and be in the audience for the show. And I remember like them pausing for commercial breaks and stuff. And he would say, you know, like, Oh, we're, we have the commercial break for this thing or whatever. And would like, promote the the thing that the commercial was for but it wasn't the commercial that was on the thing he was just sponsored by you know whatever cereals or whatever it was um but i remember him doing that you know during the thing while we were sitting there so yeah freddy krueger advertising alphabet cereal would be a bitch would be amazing i uh, to me i i think i've mentioned it on the show what i have been on in case anyone's wondering i might have been the patreon a typing of a pilot game show called Kid Go, which is like Kid Bingo. Oh. I don't know if it ever made the air or not. I was in the audience. I was never picked. That was one of the longest days of my life because we taped like 10 episodes. Oh, wow. And there's a lot of time in between resetting back up. And I w- and for Canadian fans who will know this, I would attended a taping of Switchback, which is a music, music variety talk show. Were you on that episode? I was in the audience, but I was caught on... Uh, camera. I only know this because I went to school the next day, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, you were on, you were on camera." 
and I've actually and I've been interviewed by the news a couple of times for things. Oh, for the various crimes that you've committed. If you want to call my Fringe Festival show a various crimes, yes. I just <laughs> did you know you can, I've mentioned before. Did you know you can go to certain local uh, morning news things and say, "Hey, I want to promote thing. Can you let me do a segment on your show?" And they'll go, "Yes," without asking you what you're going to promote or how you're going to promote it. Oh man, we should uh, we should go on a, a TV show and promote our podcast. It was me and my friend sitting uh, watching all these barber like barbecue tip hints of the morning news show and sitting there knowing our segment camp in an hour and a half and going all right we didn't plan on what we were going to do <laughs> we should probably write something down before the ca- the live camera for everyone in the maritimes to see us wow and we did it and then i got home and like literally everyone i knew in the maritimes <laughs> had seen what we did that's amazing yeah i, I did i don't think you could probably find that the uncle monkey episode that I was on, but um, I doubt those things ever made it online, but uh, I did go up and I think I gave him an animal thing, but I was super nervous and super embarrassed when this was, I was think I was probably four or five years old. So yeah. very, very shy at that point in my life. And, and I think I probably clammed up and didn't come up with a good, uh, a good one. I, uh, I remember the, at the game show, my cousin, Sarah was the one who took us. She's the one who got it. Cause she was always listening to the radio show radio and trying to get win prizes. Yeah. And I just remember like sitting in the crowd cause it would just, they would go like, and you and at the crowd and like, you would be the contestant for that uh-huh. episode. And I was like, please to God, do not pick me. <laughs> I, I, I have at, like, I cannot leave because a, my parents, our parents have left. Yeah. And we were here for the next 10 fucking hours. <laughs> uh, but like I cannot handle if you point at me. <laughs> yeah. When I was a kid, we had a radio, like a local radio station and they would do the, um, uh, it was, either, I think it was top eight at eight. And so on Friday nights, this is, <laughs> shows you how much of a loser I was um, on Friday nights, they would play uh, like the top eight songs of the week or something like that on yeah. the radio. It may have been top nine and nine. I don't remember, but it was that basic thing. And they would count down their top eight songs for the week or the day or whatever it was. And then you had to be like the eighth Eighth caller and you had to give them all eight songs in order. And then you would win a CD (laughs) like that was the the prize. A compact disc. Yeah. So you'd win a CD of your choice. And um, so I actually one night listened, wrote them down, called one but I never went to pick up my CD because you had to come to the radio station. Oh, I would never. And the radio station was like way out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like a kid. I'm like eight, nine years old. I have no way to drive out there. My mom is working all the time. Like my mom's not going to take me out of the radio station to pick up a CD. My cousin won all kinds of stuff because like she simply did all of them. <laughs> like every time they did it every day, she's like, oh. I'm going to call in and just, you know, we're on a huge Metro in, you know, Halifax, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. So yeah. Like she just won cash tickets and all this stuff. And oh, like, that's amazing. Be like, Brian, we're going to this. And I'm like, I don't want to. She's like, you are going with me. I'm like, Oh, fine. <laughs> Basically my older sister. And that's, that's amazing. I, I, yeah, there, there's a, I know that like the, the world has changed a lot and you can win things on, you know, Twitch streams and all kinds of shit now. And it's it's but it's not the same as having to it's sit there the, and listen to the radio and only, write down some song names. The only best way to win is be caller number or whatever on the radio. Yeah. Or take that little plastic gray thing from underneath the pop can uh-huh. pop bottle and it tells you you won something. Yeah. And you have no idea where to bring it in to win it. <laughs> yeah. You How wanna... do I claim my $5 Coke prize? Yes, yeah, like, oh, you get a free Coke. Okay, I'll go to the I'll, local... I'll go to the I'll go to the store where I bought this bottle with, that I won and they'll go, "I don't know what that is. I'm yeah, not they're... I'm not doing that." Yes, they're like, "Oh, we don't we aren't part of that." I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah, we're not affiliated in any way." Um that's always how it goes. Uh we should uh, we should put this on our our scale of weirdness. Uh, Friday the thirteenth, uh, night prey. I think was what it was called. I've forgotten already. Um, Why don't night you go, bitch. Night bitch. <laughs> it's a, it's called night bitch. It's a, it's a movie. It is a movie. It's yeah. coming out uh, sometime this year, next year, at some point. It's a Christmas special. Um, <laughs> I'll go first because it's my house. Yeah. Uh, one. Oh wow, that low. That low. It is. It is because. 
I see promise. Oh, but uh, but isn't that that's not I I'm I'm <laughs> it's anti weird because it should be weirder. Okay, I guess I get that. I still think that it deserves like a three because no, it wasn't. How about a one instead? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not great, and I oh, couldn't. We've watched worse shows, have we? Uh, yeah. Well, oh, uh, well, we watched, we watched the Wishman. Wishman, but Wishman is weirder. Yes, but th- here's the thing: like this show, because it is a Friday the Thirteenth spinoff, yeah. but it isn't. Has because of that, you would think, God, that's gonna be a weird show. Yeah. And it is every anthology show from yeah, the Yeah, it's not as you're right. It's not as weird as it could be. I'm still gonna stick with the three. Like I, I watched a lot of the Hitchhiker and Outer Limits, and they also bored the shit out of me as, as a kid. But the Hitchhiker, when it, its first season was on HBO and there was a lot of nudity, right? I believe so. There's also a lot of big big stars. Oh, I thought you were gonna say big titties. <laughs> it's a big titty hit. No one likes that phrase, and no one should. <laughs> Yeah, I I can't yeah, I can't recommend this particular episode, but some of the other ones, like the guy who's turning his wife into a dog or the evil gardener, which is might wife. be might be worth watching. Um, maybe. Uh there there is one that has like a haunted doll. Maybe we'll have to do like a haunted doll series and we'll revisit this because I think every show has a haunted doll in it. Even Family Matters, which we colors la- covered last Halloween. So go back and listen to the the uh Stevel episodes if you haven't because we covered both of those uh the ryan dalian who the 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 boy cousin oh okay Uh, he is in jason goes to hell the final friday oh but not playing that character no he's playing steve freeman steve freeman all right cool i bet you he Um, doesn't stay free for long (laughs) from machete cutting that's right yeah he he stays uh he does not stay free from injury is that the one where it's like it turns out jason's magic wait which one did you say jason goes to hell yeah yeah he's a voodoo course or something yeah he's like a he is an evil worm I watched that one. He's the worm in RFK's brain. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah, basically, I'm gonna, 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 gonna kill all the. I killed a bunch of. Uh, <laughs> I got a bunch of the uh, the, 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 the campers uh, Crystal Lake. I, I was really interested in their skulls. Wow, that's a pretty good RK Jr. impression. We'll have to break that out a little bit more while he's still in news cycle. He's barely he's barely in the news cycle there. anymore. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, they thought he was gonna he was gonna dis- disrupt things, and it did not seem to go well. He was gonna be the the sec. He's gonna have two VPs at once, one <laughs> one per coast, and um, <laughs> didn't happen. But yeah, yeah, um, Jason is like. He gets blown up by the SWAT team. Oh, that's right. It's and dark. then uh, his his like battered body goes to uh, the morgue, and then the the coroner eats his heart, and then becomes him sort of, but he doesn't look like him. He's just a guy, um, and he like tortures a bunch of people. And I think at the end, he does he does eventually like. Look, he has there's like a magic dagger or something i think <laughs> and he has to this sounds very much like i saw part, it a couple years ago for yeah. the first time because that was one that i had just i'd like, seen all the other ones a bunch and that one just i just didn't the get cover to it with the worm coming out of the mask always kind of like that doesn't seem yeah but like, that's what he is at the yeah. end he's like a weird worm creature and then what a um, dumb idea that and they then don't he, know it's clever and then he does eventually he goes to hell but at the very end and you don't actually see it. He just like he he gets he gets killed. His mask gets pulled under the ground by Freddy's glove. Like they set up the eventual, eventual Freddy eventual. versus Jason movie. And then but like you I guess like he, he gets burned up or something and he gets pulled under. So, you know, he's going to hell. But like that happens at the very end of the movie. So the movie's title gives away the end of the movie. They could have called it something else. And then it would have been a big shocker at the end when it happened. But yeah. like as it is, Jason's barely in the movie. So you you don't really get what you're hoping for. So don't watch that one. If you've never, for whatever reason, watched any of the Friday the 13th, don't start with that one. Start with the first one, which is a pretty good little mystery movie if you don't know the the twist. And then, I don't know, two, three, four, six, seven. Those are all good. I like them all. I They're like fine. seven, which has him versus a girl with psychic powers. Uh, eight is 
goes to New York, which also he doesn't get to until the end of the movie. So kind of not really. It's mostly Canada. He's mostly on a boat in Canada, I think. No, um, Le Saint Saint Laurent. I think I think the I think New York is Canada in the movie too. Like I think they in, shot in, it in a Canada. lot of movies. New York is Canada. Yeah, that is true. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that Friday the Thirteenth the series maybe revisit one day, uh, maybe, um, but not. But not today. <laughs> but not not, not today. Um, but yeah. So the, we wanted to uh, kind of get the get the spooky stuff going early. Kind of re- reveal that we're going to talk about some anthology series uh, in October. Um, so expect some things that we've covered before, but new episodes. Definitely going to give you another Freddy's nightmares because we can't stay away. Uh, maybe another Are You Afraid of the Dark? Maybe another Goosebumps. Maybe one we haven't covered yet. We've talked about quite a few. There's there's quite a few horror anthology shows out there that we haven't touched on. And uh, Friday the 13th was absolutely one of them. And since we had a Friday the 13th actually coming up, we decided to uh, get a jump on the spooky season and get this out for you. And um, we hope that your Friday the 13th is going well. You don't step on any cracks. You don't break any mirrors. You don't cross any paths of a black cat you don't step under any ladders you don't uh, open an umbrella indoors you don't uh <laughs> help me out here what are some other bad luck things that could happen uh you could um uh, i don't know die <laughs> you don't die we hope you don't die on this friday the 13th because if you do you will go to hell as the legend has it <laughs> <laughs> um but until uh next time um i've been josh i've been <laughs> and uh we want you to keep it weird and keep it spooky and keep it safe on this friday the 13th or monday the 13th either. or saturday the 14th another fantastic film go watch saturday the 14th and skip this friday the 13th episode <laughs> just go do that do that instead <laughs> been listening to center of weirdness if you like the show rate and review us wherever you find us but especially on apple podcasts you can listen to every episode at centerofweird.com where you can also find all the old predictocast episodes and if you want to get in touch with us to tell us about a show we should cover hit us up on instagram or threads at weirdness podcast and as always thanks for listening <laughs>